Good afternoon and happy Cinco de Mayo. My name is Rob Mangus. I'm a member of Greenberg Trarg's government law and policy team here in Washington, D.C. Uh, in addition to our D.C. office, we also have offices in nine state capitals across the country, which gives us a very strong federal state presence on public policy issues. Today, we will host the third installment of our congressional webinar series to discuss the latest developments on Capitol Hill. We're very pleased to host one of the top Democrats from the House Appropriations Committee as we continue our discussions with top policymakers. Now, let me bring you two of my colleagues from the Government Policy Group in D.C. First, Mr. Albert Wynn, who served as a member of Congress, a Democrat from Maryland's 4th District, he served for 15 years in the in the 4th District, just across the uh, river to the east of D.C. He was a member of the uh, Democratic leadership team as a senior Democratic whip and also a subcommittee chair uh, on issues dealing with energy and the environment. We're also uh, pleased to have with us the newest member of our government law and policy team, uh, Mr. Rodney Freelingheisen. Mr. Freelingheisen served uh, as a Republican member of Congress representing New Jersey's 11th district for 24 years. Uh, the 11th district is centered around his home county of Morris County uh, to the west of New York City. And Mr. Freelingheisen in the last Congress served as the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. I'll turn it over to them uh, to introduce our special guest. Well, thank you, Rob. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to join with you, along with my colleague, Rodney, and uh, all of the uh, Greenberg Triag uh, team. We are real pleased. We have our former Congressman Rodney For Randy Forbes, excuse me, and uh, former Congressman uh, Charlie Bass. But today on this broadcast, Rodney, if you are able, could you please take over for Mr. Wynn? Uh, uh, this is a Congress, former Congressman Rodney Freeling Eyes. I'd like to thank uh, my colleague uh, Albert Wynn for uh, joining with me again as we uh, begin the third in our series of conversations with leaders in Congress. And in this case, uh, Congressman Tim Ryan from Ohio. Let me say it's been my pleasure to to uh, work with Albert and Charlie Bass and Randy Forbes with the Greenberg Troy office in, in Washington. And let me say a, a big thanks to our tech staff. Uh, uh, now I need to say a few brief words about our special guest, uh, Tim Ryan. And uh, we have Tim right in front of you. We also have a better picture of you, which we'd be happy to use too. <laughs> Congressman Tim Ryan is in his 18th year in Congress. He represents Ohio's 13th congressional district, which runs from Akron to Youngstown and includes his hometown of Niles. He's been a champion of the American worker and a staunch defender of American manufacturing. He is co-chair of the Congressional Manufacturing Caucus. As a presidential candidate in uh, th this year, Tim Ryan was a strong, moderate voice promoting the interests of working family. I also add that he's an author of three books, one of which I've read. Tim also serves on the powerful House Appropriations Committee as, as one of what we call the Cardinals Committee Chairs. He chairs the Legislative Branch Subcommittee. He also serves on the Defense Subcommittee and as well as the Military Construction Veterans Subcommittee to other key committees, making sure that our veterans and our soldiers have all the support uh, they need. It is my pleasure to join with uh, uh, Albert Wynn to welcome Tim Ryan to talk about the current environment in Congress and what we might expect in the weeks ahead. Uh, Tim, welcome aboard. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Tim. He's a hard worker on the Appropriations Committee is a new cardinal doing a great job uh, chairing the legislative uh, branch appropriations committee. Tim, tell us a little bit about what's happening in Ohio, your interaction with your constituents at this uh, time of national crisis, 
and what what how are things proceeding in Ohio in terms of re- reopening the economy? Yeah, you got it. Thanks, Rodney. Great to be with you and great to be with Al. Uh, you know, I periodically see Al every now and again over the last few years since he's been uh, with you all. Uh, and he is he's one of my favorite people to be with. Uh, you, you got a good one there. And, and Rodney was my chairman, uh, although he, he didn't bring back earmarks like I tried to talk him into uh, probably every single day that I saw him. Uh, you know, he, he was a great leader and he was always trying to, you know, herd cats, not just on the committee, but literally in the Congress. And, and he's just a phenomenal guy. And, and I just love him. And uh, I'm, I was sad to see him go. Uh, but again, it's it's great to work with them in this capacity. So uh, anyway, great to be with everybody. Uh, Ohio is, uh, you know, on the ground in all of these states. There really is a great deal of anxiety, um, as you as you all know. I mean, that that's not exactly uh, a news flash. And you know what we're seeing is, you know, a lot of people. So I'm from Northeast Ohio. Just to tell you a little bit about the, my congressional district. Uh, Akron to Youngstown, just south of Cleveland, border up against the Pennsylvania border, about an hour from Pittsburgh. Um, so we're really in the heart of, uh, the, you know, the old steel belt, the old rubber belt, uh, the old rust belt, and, and now just trying to really climb our way out of it. Hit hard by the housing crisis 10 years ago, uh, and have been trying to recover ever since. Lost some auto plants in the process. Uh, and so now, you know, these small businesses who really um, were tenacious over the years to survive, whether you're a mom and pop manufacturing facility uh, or you are a restaurant uh, and you were able to survive all these years, I think shows a good deal of skill. Uh, but the coronavirus has, has really taken this, the challenge to the next level. And, and so there's a lot of anxiety on the ground. We have a lot of businesses who are trying to go into the the uh, uh, paycheck protection program. Uh, as many of you know, in the first tranche, it it, it took care of about uh, five uh, percent of the small businesses in the United States. The second round may get that up to to ten percent, uh, but I'm still getting calls as of today of people that have filled out applications and still uh, are in line to uh, you know get their money. A uh, lot of people still not getting their unemployment uh, checks. Uh, if you're a 1099 worker or you know a self-employed, we set up a separate uh, unemployment insurance for that. That's not even set up yet in Ohio, and they're talking about the middle of this month. People are missing their mortgages, they're missing their rent payments, and it's it's some pretty scary stuff for a lot of people. They don't they don't know which way to turn, and there's a lot of mixed messages coming out and. Uh, so it's it's tough times for for a lot of people, not even to get into the frontline healthcare workforce uh, folks and all the sacrifices that they're making. How, how are they handling the crisis? Your your healthcare workers and uh, people on the front lines. I assume it's they're stressed and overworked. Yeah, I mean we're we're seeing you know on smaller levels what you know you saw in, in New Jersey and New York, Rodney. Um, you know, just completely overwhelmed. And, and, you know, you think, well, you suck it up, you go to work, you know, whatever, you know, 12 hours on, 12 hours off or whatever the shifts may be. But the reality of it is that's just part of it. The other part of it is you, you have to self isolate from your family. So those normal 12 hour days that you had off or whatever days you have off, you know, you're not, you're not hugging your kids. You know, you're not in bed with your spouse or your kids. You're you're isolated in your own home, and and that to me is is why you're starting to see a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the mental health issues because we're a we're a social creature and we we crave connection. And when you're in really high stress environments and you can't have that connection, it begins to grind on you. And we're starting to see that. And I think this this is. Uh, can can you uh, still still hear me, Tim? Uh, just yeah, uh, somebody you know, called and I had to I had to message him, so we're good. Okay, well, good. I hear a dog barking in the back too. That's a very good sound. You'll hear dogs and kids and sweepers and all kinds of stuff. So <laughs> Albert and I appreciate you taking some time out of a busy family life and congressional life to 
talk with the Greenberg Tort uh, team and its clients. Can you talk a little bit about your legislative branch committee, which uh, is your first committee chairman's uh, ship? I hear you're doing a great job. You have now an expansive role. Now you, you have responsibility for 435 members, enormous numbers of staff, uh, millions of visitors, which we hope will return to Washington. How is your, how are you putting together your, your uh, 2020 or 2021 bill uh, to meet all these anticipated needs uh, during this uh, time of crisis? Yeah, you know better than anybody, Rodney, the, the appropriations process is always a, uh, there are always moving targets and there, there are always changes happening, but this, this has been significant, significant. The legislative branch is the smallest of the subcommittees. It's only about $5 billion, uh, compared to the, uh, Defense Appropriations Committee at 780 billion. Um, but now with everything going on, it is, it is really important for those who don't know, we oversee the, the Library of Congress, the Capitol, the Capitol Police, the architect of the Capitol, the attending physician's office, um, and so all the botanical gardens, all of these are under the auspices of that committee. And so talking about uh, making sure that it's safe for people to come, I mean, first and foremost, uh, members of Congress and staff. So we've been really leaning on the attending physician to really help guide us um, we had a, we had a online, uh, hearing, uh, two weeks ago and, uh, people say, well, Congress isn't working, you know, we're, we're working all day long, probably like a lot of you are. Uh, but we, we had a hearing with the attending physician with the appropriations committee and I chaired it. And, and from that, uh, hearing came a lot of concerns from members of Congress about coming back. Uh, and the very next day is when Steny Hoyer announced that, you know, we were going to delay it at least another week. And there were concerns about getting on airplanes and concerns about going through TSA and concerns about staff and concerns about D.C. and Virginia and uh, Maryland having uh, increased rates. And those people all come to work in, in the Capitol. So um, some, some realistic concerns. And, but anyway, the point is that, you know, you know we're doing this uh, weekly. And, you know, we'll have another hearing this week, but we're leaning on the experts, which I think it's appropriate for politicians to do. And when there's a situation like this is not to just go off half cocked on what you think, but what the scientists and doctors and virologists and infectious disease people tell you what, what the best move is. And then obviously we, we have to make the decision. Uh, no, before turning to Albert, can you uh, talk a little bit about one of our one of your colleagues, we had Congressman Tom Cole on a few days yeah. ago, and he was, of course, he's an institutional person. He loves the institution, cares about the members and, and developing members. He was talking about uh, working out with the with his Democratic colleagues, raising the budget caps. I mean, just in your area, you know, just take a look at the cafeterias. I mean, m most people don't think of the cafeterias, but You've got hearings that have to be scheduled that you have to have a certain degree of separation probably for months. Uh, do, do you anticipate that the leadership will talk about raising the budget caps that have been pretty strict uh, under the circumstances we're in now? I, I mean, I would hope so. I mean, we're, we're kind of with these uh, special bills we've been doing, the CARES Act and the ones before that. I mean, we're blowing through budget caps because of the emergencies um, um, that we're in. And I think that would be appropriate um, uh, to do it now. And for a couple reasons. One, you take the legislative branch, you know, coming in, cleaning the facilities, making sure they're safe. That's you're going to need more manpower, at least more man hours. Uh, to be able uh, to do that. The revenues are down. You know, you look at the, the gift shops and the kind of things you don't really think about, uh, the cafeterias and, and, you know, all the little shops along the way in, in the office buildings, they're empty. So there's no, no revenue really coming in from any of that. And then the other thing really is, um, staffing. I mean, my staff, uh, we've been, you know, you remember this. I mean, the, the, the MRAs and members allowances have been, you know, pretty stagnant over the last 10 years. And, and so, you know, as people retired or, or moved on from my staff, 
we never really hired anybody else uh, over the last 10 years. We, we let a lot of people go and, you know, maybe fill the spot here or there. But for the most part, we're, we're understaffed. And, and, you know, you look at the incoming now. I mean, everyone's calling our office about unemployment insurance. Everybody, every small business is calling our office. Um, they, whether you're a veteran, you're this, you're that. There, it is times 10 of what it, if not more, of what it is normally. And so I do think we need a little bit more money just to be able to meet the demand of our constituents. And that may mean us hiring another person or two. I'm going to push for that. I'm not, you know, convinced it's going to go anywhere, but, um, these caps need to be, need to be lifted. And I'll, I'll tell you another thing, or at least it lifted to some extent, which we could we'll probably talk about in another question that you have. But part of the way I'm looking at this is like, what do we have to do now? public health wise, stabilizing the economy wise, and then what are the investments that we have to make to win the future? Because this is changing everything, telemedicine, digital learning, distance learning, you know, uh, you, you're looking at who's most susceptible to viruses like this, and you, you get into a conversation around diabetes and obesity and heart disease and all of these things, pre-existing conditions, so that gets you into a conversation about preventative health care and food and all of these things. So I hope we have the, the wisdom to deal with the crisis at hand, but also start laying some groundwork for what America 2.0 looks like coming out of this thing. Is, uh, Albert, are you back in or am I on solo? Uh, I guess oh, I'm solo. Albert is Thank still you. not with us. Uh, could, I know that you introduced something called the Emergency Money for People Act. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, obviously the economic impact of the pandemic has been huge on your constituents, on individual uh, households. Can you talk a little bit about your reasoning behind that uh, proposal? Sure, sure. So uh, Congressman Ro Khanna and I uh, have a proposal uh, that will give $2,000 a month to everybody who makes less than $130,000 a year. Uh, couples that make less than $260,000 a year, this would include college students and uh, 16 years or older, disabled, vets, Social Security, the whole nine yards. And the reason really is uh, what we're doing now is is not enough. I mean, when you look into the future, you say, okay, people got a $1,200 check. We increased the federal unemployment insurance to $600 plus your state. Now, for the vast, for some people, and this makes the news, uh, you have conversations around, well, people now are making more to stay at home uh, than they are to be at work. And so in Ohio, for example, if your job opens back up, you have to go back and take that job. And I think we can we can make sure we work around that. But that's the kind of scintillating, you know, I'm going to be pissed off at government because people are going to sit at home and that whole line of of argument. Um, but the reality of it is some people are making more, but a lot of people aren't anywhere near what they were making. And so what we're saying is if we're going to stabilize the economy, and I think there's two real main factors here, in my, at least in my thinking on how to do this. One is to stabilize the economy. I mean, unless we're going to defer mortgage payments, uh, defer auto loans, defer personal loans, defer credit card payments, defer student loans, student loans we have, um, people aren't able to pay their bills. And so we've had 4 million people in April, 3.8 million people in April, not pay their mortgage. We've had about 10% of people in April not pay their rent, and that's just going to continue to increase. And so these people are just falling further and further behind as this, as this thing goes on. Are we borrowing money to do this? Yes. Is it a lot of money? Yes. But how the second pillar of this is how do we come out of this? And we have to come out of this with some economic stability in the consumer, because 70% of our economy is consumer spending. The consumer has to have some money in their pockets. So not only stabilizing and making sure they don't fall behind, but if we want a, a U-shaped recovery and not an L-shaped recovery or deep recession or depression, we've got to make sure that these people have money in their pockets. And that's what this is doing. And uh, it's, a dire it's a direct shot and it's going to help everybody. And lastly, it's going to help those small businesses. So maybe we've only taken care of 10% of the small businesses in the United States. Not, that's not a whole lot, 3.2 million out of 32 million. Um, but 
those small business owners, most who make less than 130,000, or if they own it with their spouse, make less than 260. So maybe we can't get that business up and running uh, through the PPP program, but for God's sake, at least the family will be stabilized because now they, they have 4,000 bucks a month and 500 per kid up to three. So you can potentially get 5,500 bucks a month. So, you know, that's like 10 grand a month. I mean, that you can stabilize yourself. What's $1,200 in New York City or New Jersey or something? That's getting you nowhere. 600 bucks a week. I mean, come on. And uh, if, if we're going to try to get out of this with some sense of economic stability, I believe this is the right way to do it. Can, can we talk about uh, the, the CARES Act and, and, and some of the things that we've already invested in? Do, do you feel that it's been a success so far? I think a lot of focus has been on the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, and obviously, there's some negative uh, issues and some controversy. But what's the, been the reception uh, out in your neck of the woods in Ohio uh, about the federal effort to date? Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, people for the most part are reasonable and, you know, they knew we were trying to push $2 trillion through a garden hose um, to try to get it out into the communities um, the, the quickest, most efficient and effective way we could. Um, and while I have been arguing for these cash payments, the, the PPP program is really, again, how do you get to a U-shaped curve? Uh, out of this thing so people will hire their workers and and then those workers will be back and ready to go when the virus passes, um, which I think in theory sounds good, but the reality of it is we're not quite sure how long this is going to last. And you read about different strands forming today. There was an article in the Los Angeles Times this morning about that. Um, you look at, you take out New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, the rest of the country is still increasing uh, contamination and, uh, and, and it's still being transmitted in a very significant way. There are reports now that deaths will be up to 3,000 a day by June 1st. Um, and so my problem is that these small businesses are being asked to spend this money now. You have until June 30th to spend the money. So if you're a restaurant in Ohio, you're not open yet and you probably won't be open for a little while. And so they're asking you to spend this money now so that you can open when the country opens back up. You're going to be out of money by then. And so we need to move that date back to probably to the fall and allow these businesses to hold on to the money to prepare for uh, opening up. I think that's the main flaw. As far as the hospitals getting money, the universities getting money, it's not nearly enough, but they're getting enough to stabilize themselves. I think that's been that's been really helpful. Um, and, and the unemployment has been helpful, but again, not enough. And the PPP has been helpful, but not enough. I've been calling for a trillion dollars. I mean, we're, you know, we're at 10%, we're going to be at probably 10% of small businesses. I mean, you're writing off millions and millions of, of hard working people's businesses that they built. So I get it. Um, but I think we've got to, we've got to put some tweaks in here. And again, the big the big uh, elephant in the middle of the room is the state and local uh, governments who uh, have been left out of this process. There was a little help early on, but for the most part, they're in deep, deep trouble. Before, before we uh, give you a breather here, before we sort of move on to what might be in the next bill, uh, people tend to forget, you don't, that the Federal Reserve is actually putting a lot of money in the economy. And, and I know that there's going to be launching, I think it's called the Main Street Lending Program. It's going to put some money out there. Uh, uh, they're, they're not forgivable loans uh, like, like the uh, the other program, but the, it, it is a way to stimulate the economy. Yeah, I mean, I, and, I, and I'm all for it. Um, the payroll tax cut, I'm all for it. You know, I think it's got to be, we've got to be really pragmatic here. I don't think you can bring some ideology to this because um, that doesn't work. We saw how that happened uh, and it, it doesn't work properly. It is so, the economy is so integrated with the public health piece. It's just, you can't, you can't take one step on one side of that without taking a, another step on the other. And so um, I, I think the Fed needs to be doing that. 
but until there's real confidence in in on behalf of the consumer, um, they're not going to go out. And and so again, you're going to have you know loans. Maybe uh, you're getting a pretty good rate on it, but still a business taking out a loan and forced to make payments on it when you don't have customers. I mean, the perfect example really is is the the restaurant industry. I mean, you know, you you talk about social distancing and you know, we just picked up some carry out from a, a local restaurant here the other night and I was talking to the owner and he was just like, I can't make any money at all filling out one uh, of every third table because I've got to practice social distancing. So you, everybody knows how restaurants make money. We've all, you know, worked there, bartended there, waiter, waitress. I mean, we know how this works. You got to have volume. You got to have turnover. Your margins are so thin. They're between seven and 10% for most of these small businesses. So um, the loans are great, but, you know, I, I mean, and I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer either. You know, Rodney, I mean, you know me, I'm a pretty optimistic guy. My staff, their right. critique, you know, they all have, every staff has a critique of their boss is that, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit too optimistic, which uh, is, is not common in Washington, but it keeps, keeps me, uh, keeps me upbeat. And it's just, it's hard to see how we're, you know, how this is all going to play out. Again, that's why I try to keep focused on America 2.0 and what can we do. But in between now and then, my God, we're going to, we got a hell of a ride here. And I think the best thing our leaders can do is really prepare us for, you know, how difficult this is going to be. And, you know, but I, I'm all for private sector, the Fed, you know, monetary policy, fiscal policy, all hands on deck at this point. Can we uh, uh, talk a little bit about the next bill? You you made reference. Uh, I, I think uh, Speaker Pelosi has talked about a, maybe a trillion dollars in new funding. Of course, I think as you know, as a, an appropriator as I was, we're, we're pretty close to the annual budget, which is three point trillion that we pass each year. So to some extent, we put a lot of money out there. Can you talk about the uh, state and local government uh, plan that uh, the speakers uh, uh, outlined that, that, and, and why it's needed? I think we know why it's needed, but can you talk a little bit about uh, where, let's say, uh, Youngstown is? Or, or uh, I happen to see uh, yeah. the, uh, your, your mayor, Tito, from uh, Youngstown on TV yeah. And, yeah. and the mayor of Dayton the other day. It was CNBC. I, Guess I shouldn't be giving them a plug, but there, there was an Ohio, <laughs> an Ohio uh, uh, thing on TV with I think Tito Brown and the, the woman who's the mayor of Dayton talking about what their needs were, and to some extent uh, d dismissing some of the some of the things that were attributed to the Senate leader. Yeah, you know, again, like we we can't make this a, a political thing. It can't be a red state, blue state thing. And and the idea of the state and local governments, again, it's just the next phase of the economy shutting down. There's no revenue coming in, and and the cities didn't do anything wrong. The states doing it didn't do anything wrong. Some states have pension issues, some don't. Um, but uh, I don't think the states are asking for money for pensions. They're asking for money to keep things afloat, like the prisons and the county jails and the police and the fire and the public health uh, officials who are, are so critical at this at this moment. The the state police. I mean, literally, uh, you know, you you could cut the state staff in half because the way the general revenue projections are, are looking. And and that is a disaster. And and then you will, if these states file bankruptcy, then you will be going into these pension funds and and giving a lot of hardworking people a haircut. Uh, then you will have stress on your correctional institutions. And so it's only natural that that we would also make sure we plug those holes so that the police and fire aren't being um, laid off right now in communities all across the United States. And you know, you want to make sure that, you know, the basic city services and public services are being are being met. Uh, and, you know, these are the kind of conversations we need to have. And we can't we can't demagogue them. We can't, you know, turn it into a political football. I think we all got to join hands. And to that end, I mean, I've been working very closely with Governor Mike DeWine here in, in Ohio. 
you know, texting back and forth. He, him and I have a relationship, Ronnie, like you and I have a relationship. We're very friendly. We try to work with each other the best we can. There's always going to be some philosophical disagreement here or there. But for the most part, you try to work with them, especially in a freaking global pandemic. I mean, like, what are we talking about here? Like, we have a, a higher calling, a higher responsibility. Um, and I, I thought what the what the Senate Majority Leader said was was inappropriate. It was inciting the the kind of politics that we all hope we can leave behind from this thing. I mean, again, America 2.0. I hope we can get rid of some of the the animosity and the just the vitriol and the you know the twi governing through Twitter um, drives you nuts and you can't get anything done. And you know, I, I hope we I hope that the Senate majority leader doesn't fall prey. I hope our leadership doesn't fall prey to that. Can we uh, talk for a few minutes about the whole issue of liability protection? You know, there's, there's the, the, uh -huh. the president has, you know, finally done something with the Defense Production Act, which requires, and I think you have facilities in your, in your part of the country, which are, were open or have to be, uh, or mandated to be open, but you obviously have hospital workers, you have, uh, truck drivers, FedEx, UPS, you have people uh, handling food across the nation. Is there some possibility of some short-term protection tied into in, in into the next package? I, I know it's not without controversy, but there are a lot of people yeah. that have put their, their lives on the line, uh, many of which you've mentioned, first responders, police and fire, first aid people uh, that, that are doing the, the work of the Lord. Yeah, yeah, no question. And again, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. I'm open to have the conversation. Uh, I don't want some, uh, you know, blanket liability protections that are going to really, um, you know, uh, tilt tilt these standards away from the workers. Um, you know, if if uh, businesses are following certain protocols that they need to follow, if if there are industry standards um, that are being met. You know, I understand wanting some level of protection uh, given the circumstances that we're in. Uh, and at the same time, you know, these are workers that are going to very dangerous uh, jobs. And we want to make sure that if, if somebody is cutting a corner, um, that, that those workers are also protected. So, again, that's going to take a, some adults in the room to really figure out how to, how to balance that out. Um, you know, some of the things we're seeing, we saw a vice president over at Amazon uh, retire or resign uh, the last couple of days because he didn't feel like the workers on the floor were really getting their their voice heard. Um, so, I mean, it's not Russia where they're throwing you out of the window at the hospital if you're if you're talking. But they, those workers, too, need some level of of protection and, and they need to be heard. And for someone high up at Amazon to resign over this is a signal that maybe they're not being hurt. So, you know, again, it's got to be somewhere in the middle. The center got a hold here. The, the the next bill is obviously going to be humongous. It's going to be huge. At least that's the talk. Uh, there's more to the whole issue of infrastructure, and, and I know you're supportive of, you know, uh, uh, roads and bridges, you know, things that are important for, you know, flood control, things that are, absolutely essential for moving goods and services, navigation issues. But uh, I, I, I hear a lot of talk of support. We had uh, uh, your majority uh, leader, uh, your whip on, Jim Clyburn, talked about uh, much more investment in broadband. Can you talk about that and drinking water systems and th things, things that may not actually be on everybody's radar screen? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, you've had some good ones on. If you've had Clyburn and uh, Tom Cole, I mean, those are the those are the kind of people I think that could help. You're, you're one of the good uh, ones too. Well, yeah, I am. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm a member of Congress, Rodney. I don't lack humility, as you know. It comes <laughs> with the job. But those are those are those are great guys, and and uh, those are the kind of conversations we need to be having. But yeah, absolutely with broadband. So here's the perfect example. You know, we see so many kids uh, today uh, because of what's happened uh, that is really exposing the digital divide in the country. So some of these schools send kids home. Some of them have a computer. Some of them don't. Uh, and if you don't, you're really going to fall behind. You may have a computer. You may not have access to Wi-Fi. 
um, uh, or, or the internet. So we have kids literally driving the high school so that they can download their assignments. Um, but not all these kids have cars. I mean, you can just see how, how complex this is and how so many kids can fall behind. Um, you know, we're pretty lucky here. My wife's a teacher, so she's home. So our, you know, high schoolers are here. She can uh, help. Our, our five-year-old Brady will be six in June. She's helping Brady. I'm helping Brady with his homework. So, but, but we're both home. Um, many people are working. They're nurses. They're out. Their doctors are out, you know, in the world and, and, and can't be home. So, and they don't have internet and they don't have a computer. And so the question I think moving out of this is, are we going to update the country in a significant way that is going to allow us to compete with 330 million people, compete with 1.4 billion people in China. And, and part of that will consist of these public investments that have to be made in order to plug these kids in and plug these families in. And you can talk about those as expenses on a, a balance sheet, or you could talk about those with regard to investments. And, and when we see these kids falling further and further and further behind, doing things like what Mr. Clyburn wants to do, invest in the broadband in a significant way. It's a jobs program, but it's also plugging these kids in. And I will tell you that, you know, if we continue to go down the road we're going, we're going to have a significant number to the tune of millions of kids. I mean, when you think about half the kids that go to public school in the United States are poor. Half. This happened like a year or two ago. Uh, and so those are the kids that are, and they're white, and they're black, and they're brown, and they're urban, and they're rural. And so those kids are going to continue to fall behind over the course of the next decade. And then where the hell are we going to be? And, and so these investments are really critical. And I, we've got to talk about them in a significant way. Uh, we are going to fall behind. So I'm, I'm big time supportive of, of what Mr. Clyburn's doing. Yeah, your, your leadership has talked and, and I think we've seen it demonstrated the, 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 the number of children each day. That, that, it, that may get the best meal of the day through their school system. Yeah. I'm not looking, I don't think anyone's looking to expand and make things too expensive, but in reality, it's that, it's that type of, of, of issue that often gets left behind as people are rushing ahead with the, uh, their other priorities. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think about, I, I played a lot of sports here in Ohio growing up and, uh, there's the dogs again. Um, and, and I, I remember, I had some really good coaches, you know, from Ohio and my coaches were like the last era of the Woody Hayes style coach, you know, football coaches, Bear Bryant style. They came out of that world and that's kind of how they coach. But I, I use this as an example. I remember inevitably, whether it's football or basketball, we would be doing well and then, and then we would like have a couple of bad games. And I remember the practices after a bad game or two, we always went back to the fundamentals, right? Sometimes you can put more complexity into the offense or the defense or whatever it is you're doing. It just gets a little too complicated. You got to kind of come back, get to the fundamentals, shoot free throws, you know, whatever, you know, run, block, tackle, hit, whatever the case may be. I feel like we're there now in the United States. I feel like things have gotten so complicated that we have forgotten the importance of some of the fundamentals, like the infrastructure we're talking about with broadband, talking about food. And you see that the, 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 the issue now, half the country, Rodney, has either diabetes or pre-diabetes, okay, because of the food we are eating. Now, this isn't, I tried to talk about this a little bit during the presidential campaign, and it wasn't scintillating enough to, like, you know, break through but the reality of it is, how in the hell are we going to afford health care 20 years from now or 10 years from now when half the country has diabetes? There is going to be no way Medicare, Medicaid, and you brought up the uh, school lunches. A lot of times the, the food we're feeding our kids is not healthy food. And so I, I was at a school a few, um, about a year or two ago. The breakfast was a Rice Krispie treat and a thing of chocolate milk. And so that was about 80, because I'm looking on the back, how many grams of, uh, you know, sugar. In it. it was like 80 grams of sugar 
And, and so every four grams is a teaspoon, right? So if you think about it with white sugar, uh, a teaspoon is four grams. So that would be like giving a kid 20 teaspoons of white sugar before they start school. And we do that throughout the course of their school careers, you know, for however many years, 14, 15 years. And we wonder why they got diabetes. And then in a lot of these school districts, those kids are on Medicaid. So we're going to pay for their diabetes. We're paying to feed them these, this bad food. And all I'm saying is like, we got to stop. Like, let's get back to the fundamentals. We know this isn't good for them. I'd rather pay a little bit up front to give them a little bit better food and stop with all the highly processed, highly refined sugar, high fructose corn syrup, all that good stuff. Um, and you probably didn't think you'd get a food lesson here today, but I, I just really believe in my heart that if we're going to bend the cost curve on healthcare costs, we've got to start looking about what we're feeding our kids. And then they can't pay attention. Then they, you know, they're hiked up, hopped up for two classes. Then they crash in the third period and then they do it all over again at lunch and then they get diabetes. Like we're doing something uh, tremendously wrong here. And so I hope that as we're talking about slowing down, being at home, taking a step back, reevaluating, that we can actually try to think through some of these things in a, in a much more thoughtful and methodical way um, so that these kids could, again, to perform at a high level, have high cognitive functioning going on so that they can have broadband and learn their assignments and be able to pay attention, you know, and, you know, hopefully at some point help us compete against China. But they're all tied together. You, you may remember that uh, you and Dave Israel came to my congressional district in northern New Jersey to meet with uh, yeah. one of my constituents, Ray Chambers, has done some remarkable things relative to what you're talking about, wellness, as well as did some remarkable things to, to save yeah, children with the, with from the veterans. In, 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 uh, in Africa. Interestingly enough, in my conversation with uh, your colleague, Tom Cole, he used another sports analogy to talk about where we are with this crisis. And he said, we're basically in the fourth inning. This is the baseball analogy. We're, we're, we're not out of the game. We're not out of the woods yet. And, and we should anticipate, understandably, that we're going to be spending more money before we have some degree of regularity or, or normalcy. I do want to yeah. shift just for a minute, since you mentioned China, we, we found that it's not just uh, our pharmaceutical base where a lot of things are, are uh, originate in China, like 60 or 70 percent are often the pharmaceutical agents, but you know, come from a manufacturing state with an incredible history that there's a whole supply line of, of things that go into automobiles and into uh, various a pro, you know, that, that, uh, that the, the, yeah. the, the, the genius is still here domestically, but in many ways, yeah. some of it has migrated. And do you get a sense as, as these bills are developed that there'll be a little more selfishness on our own part and a little more scrutiny of, of what the Chinese have done basically to eat our economy? Yeah, I think there's a general awareness, you know, guys like me who come from places like where I come from have been talking about this for a long time. Chinese currency manipulation, uh, Duncan Hunter, Duncan Hunter's dad, Duncan Hunter, uh, and I, he was chair of the Armed Services Committee at that point when I first got to Congress. We started working on a China, Chinese currency manipulation bill uh, together. And so this has been an issue for a long time. And then again, the the virus has really pulled the veil back on on uh, public health manufacturing, for lack of a better phrase. I think there was a concentration, too, of like IV bags in Puerto Rico. And then the, the hurricane hit and there was a, a global issue around getting uh, IV bags. Same thing. Like, look, we're not going to make every gown, every glove, every goggle, you know, here in the United States. I understand that. Um, but we have to be able to make enough ventilators and gloves and to be able to supply our own people in the middle of a pandemic so that our people are protected. And so I, what I'd like to see us do is, is to talk about how do we use grants 
low interest loans. There's a you know advanced technology vehicle program that uh, Tesla has used. Maybe we expand that into allowing public health manufacturing businesses to use super low interest loans. Um, how do we get the private sector uh, involved? Uh, to, to help make this happen. And again, it doesn't have to be make everyone here, but make sure we have enough capacity to be able to ramp things up here in the United States to supply ourselves. And then let's, how do we think about that in the context of the defense industrial base? And you and I have had this conversation a lot, making sure that it, whether it's raw materials or, you know, supply chain or certain component parts that we're able to make and manufacture those as well. So that's kind of like a basic, how do we, you know, take care of our own and be able to supply our own? That's kind of a defensive posture or a, a bare minimum. And again, during the presidential race, I talked a lot about creating an industrial policy here in the United States. When you look at the fact that China is making tens of millions of electric vehicles, they, before Corona anyway, they dominated about 50% of the electric vehicle market. And when you look at the opportunities around making and manufacturing the tens of millions of electric vehicles that, that are going to be produced in the next de decade, why wouldn't we want an industrial policy here in the United States to help make that happen? I'm not talking about the government taking over. I'm, a, I'm about the government helping our industries dominate this. Again, grants, low interest loans. How do we dominate electric vehicles? How do we dominate batteries? How do we dominate the membranes? How do we dominate um, the charging stations. I mean, those are like my my friends, like the IBEW workers who are going to do the charging stations all over the uh, the country. Huge job program, public, private. But I think once the public sector gets things rolling, it could take off. But let's have a national industrial policy around this. Look at China. They have this China 2025 plan where they want to dominate like the top 10 industries in the world around aerospace, wind, solar, AI, um, you know, uh, additive manufacturing. They want to dominate all these. Where's our plan to do that? You know, how do we have a plan like Germany does? Ours would probably look a lot more like Germany to both coordinate the investments, make sure everybody's paddling in the same direction, close the skills gap, because that's the real issue where we have 70 million people that are low skilled and we have 70, well, we did, you know, 60 or 70 million higher skilled jobs available that are going unfilled, that's a, 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 that's not a Democrat or Republican thing. So close that skills gap, work with the businesses to be able to make that happen and create a real agenda around dominating these industries. Now, I just say lastly, too, I mean, that's how you beat China. You don't beat China just tariffs and yelling at them and, and all that. That hasn't worked. And just ask the farmers. Um, but I do think they we need to have fair trade. But anyway, um, lastly, Rodney, we have like 40 to 50 percent of our small, mid-sized manufacturers actually utilize new technologies like artificial intelligence. So how do we update something like the Manufacturing Extension Program and, and put some real dollars behind that to say, look, let's get this technology into a mom and pop shop that's got 50 employees in Niles, Ohio, and and get them plugged in. They can't afford to go hire a consultant or a fancy law firm to help them like negotiate. Let's get a program that actually plays offense. That's where I think government can be really helpful. And then what we're seeing is those small mid-sized manufacturers dramatically increase productivity. And maybe they'll add 75 jobs, maybe they'll add 50 jobs. It goes from 50 to 100, but you know what? That company's gonna be viable for a long time. So you may not add a thousand jobs, but you have now a viable company in a small town that's paying taxes into the general fund that they could then utilize. They could do a, they could do a TIF or do tax increment financing and use that money to float a bond. I mean, there's all kinds of creative ways to do it, but we've got to be aggressive and start playing some offense on some of these things. And we're just not doing it. As we move to the top of the hour and we've taken quite a lot of your time, could you comment on, uh, where, where you think we're going with, you've, you've conducted a remote hearing, other committees have, there's talks of proxy voting and remote voting. I know uh, uh, Jim McGovern is working very closely with Tom Cole and they're part of a leadership team working yeah. together. I just wonder whether you had any comments and as you answer that, 
could you maybe give us uh, your what worries you the most, what keeps you up worried uh, every night about what the future might bring as a result of what we've seen over the last six or eight weeks, pretty horrendous. So your views on yeah. remote voting, uh, your constitutional responsibilities, and then maybe a, a look to see what keeps you, worries you the most as a member of Congress, a senior member of Congress. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh open this because there's a lot of ground to probably cover here. But I, I support this the, the idea of remote voting, um, proxy voting. We've got to figure this out. Coincidentally enough, it was uh, all the way back to the 9-11 Commission. They were, they were saying we got to figure out how to how to vote remotely if one of those planes, you know, would have hit the Capitol building. What would we have done? Uh, so I think, you know, now because it, that was a one-time event, but now this is kind of dragging on. I, I'm hoping it gives us more of an incentive to really get this thing done. We do Facebook Lives all the time, and you could very easily have a public vote, you know, and even explain how you vote. But you go on Facebook Live, hi, it's Tim Ryan. I'm voting X, Y, or Z. I know there's some concern that some of these, you know, other countries may hack in to, to disrupt, but I think there's a way to do it in a public way, in a protected way. Um, we do it all the time. Our banking system does it. The Pentagon does it. You know, we we could do that as well. And I'm all for it. I think it's appropriate. We're getting a lot of work done here at home. I got to tell you, as a, as a dad, uh, it's been a lot of fun to like be at home with the kids all the time. And I'm like, man, I you know, it's going to be hard to go back and leave for three days a week again, and you know, kind of miss out on on some of the stuff that's happening. So that's kind of real world stuff. And then, you know what I worry about more than anything? Um, you know, we're going to get through this. Uh, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be long. I hope that we come out of this, um, and I worry that we won't, but I, my hope is that we come out of this with a really renewed sense of togetherness, you know, for lack of a better term, of, of a real, a deeper connection um, to each other a newfound respect for like a lot of the people who we kind of, whether it was the cashier at the grocery store, or the cop or the firefighter, or the person delivering the food, nurses, doctors, like I, I hope there's a newfound respect for that. Everybody matters. Everybody has a role to play here in our country and everybody's important. And it's the small business person. It's the big business person. It's the, you know, it's the cashier. And my wife's a teacher and she's getting texts from, you know, a lot of people that are, you know, uh, parents, her and her colleagues that are saying, you know, I can't I can't believe you don't get paid the more to do this. I have one of these kids at home. You have 25 or 30 in the classroom. Um, one was kind of cute at the end. The, the text said something like this is actually your kid and you need to come get him right now. <laughs> so, <it> was, <laughs> um, and, and so, but there's a newfound appreciation for teachers. And I just mm -hmm. hope we can hold on to that as we move forward. I just, I'm so tired of the old stuff and so are you, the old, the bickering, the fighting, the partisanship, the ideology, the lack of clear thinking, it just drives you nuts. And I hope we get out of this with that deeper connection Kind of like our, you know, my grandparents had, you know, telling me stories about the Depression. I mean, they were Democrats and Republicans, but they were all, they, you know, they went to church together. They were at the Rotary and the Kiwanis together, and they were Americans, and there was, you know, a general connection, uh, and there was advancement, progress that was always happening, and people were engaged. I hope one of the things, you know, I'm obviously campaigning for Joe Biden, that that we could do um, should he get in is really, again, a national service initiative to really c continue to try to knit this country back together, take some of the civic spirit that's out there now. I mean, our neighbors texted us last week. They're like, hey, we're uh, everybody in the street's going to donate a box of food and we're going to take it to the food bank or whatever. And, you know, my wife like immediately got a box of food together and I ran it over and put it on their front porch. And th that's just happening all over the country. So I hope I hope this all doesn't go for naught and that there's no real super big benefit coming out of it. Now, Albert Wynn and I would like to thank you on behalf of the Greenberg Chorig team and uh, just the chance at least for Albert have a brief interview with you, but for me a longer interview. And, and thank you for your, your public service and your incredible work on the House Appropriations 
but on behalf of the nation and the residents of your congressional district, Rob, back to you. Thank you, Rodney. You did Thanks, a terrific Rodney. job. We, we kind of set you up there thinking you were going to share the, the space with uh, with Albert Wynn and had a little technical glitch. I, I wanted to, if Congressman, if you would entertain one more question. Uh, we sure. started with, uh, I'm an Ohio native. We started with the discussion uh, of Ohio, and I wondered if you uh, could comment the, the the numbers in Ohio have been uh, significantly better, uh, especially early on, than even some of the neighboring states. And I wonder if there's something you could share with us that, that is, Ohio is doing that's a little bit different uh, than, than some of the other states are doing that might be uh, worthwhile for us all to think about. Sure, sure. Where are you from in Ohio? Uh, I grew up in Toledo, a little bit to the west of Oh, it. all right. Nice. Yeah, I went to Bowling Green. Okay. And, uh, and those, those, two, those football and basketball coaches I was talking about both came out of Toledo, and they were tough. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they were tough. Um, yeah, hard, hard nose, hard nose guys. Um, you know, Governor DeWine, as I said, has, has been doing a good job. He was in early. You know, he followed the science. He followed the experts. He had the courage. You know, I'm sure he didn't run for governor to deal with the global pandemic or understand infectious disease or viruses or anything like that. But he followed the experts and he had the courage to make a lot of tough decisions. And and I give him all the credit in the world for doing that. He's getting a, a backlash now, you know, from a lot of these right wing groups that that are saying that, you know, he's not opening things up fast enough. He really we got in early. We followed the science. And, and we bent, you know, we flattened that, that curve out. Um, and you always have challenges. We have some prisons and nursing homes and different things. But I think that was really it. He was out early. He followed the leader of Dr. Atkin, who's the head of Ohio uh, Department of Public Health, um, Youngstown native. And, uh, you know, so we're super proud of her. But he, he followed it and got in early. And I think that when you, when you take a step back, you know, and you look at the difference between what he's doing and what some of these other you know, people are doing, some of these other governors are doing that aren't following the science, they're following the politics. Um, you know, obviously history is going to be, have the last word on this, but we'll see where it goes. But, and then, and then he's, he's slowly rolling things out. Um, you know, he's, he's, uh, slowly opening things up. He extended, here's a great example, like he extended the stay at home order to the end of May and, uh, Monday, you know, they started elective surgeries back up, construction, some transportation uh, stuff opened up on Monday. Retail will go next week. But he extended the stay at home order till the end of the month. So basically, we'll have a couple weeks to kind of see what the effects are of the slow, thoughtful, more methodical rollout. And then we'll see the numbers because we saw in our local hospitals two weeks after Easter weekend. Two weeks after Easter weekend, we had a spike uh, at our local hospitals. And it was all because Easter weekend, people were out and about more. And so you could almost track it uh, two weeks. So what, he's going to track it, and we'll see where we are at the end of May. And I you know, trust him to probably make some other good decisions. But he's been really thoughtful. It's really, I think, he's been one of the best in the country in handling this, this part of the virus. Well, as Rodney said, we thank you very much for your time. You've been very generous with it. Um, and on behalf of Greenberg Thanks. Park, let me uh, also express a, a special thank you to you. We really appreciate uh, the, the insights you've given us on a number of a variety of different issues. And we know the Appropriations Committee agenda is always full. You'll be extremely busy uh, in the weeks ahead. And we're, we're very grateful for uh, the leadership role that you continue to play in Congress. Yeah, let me just say, it. please give. Give Al my best, too. I'm sorry we didn't get to spend more time together. I was looking forward to uh, having some fun with him. But give give him my best, and, and thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. We'll do that. Thank you. Uh, if All I right. could, as a final word, uh, as a reminder to our uh, audience, uh, we'll be having our fourth webinar in this series on Friday, uh, May 8th uh, at 11 o'clock. Congressman Greg Walden from Oregon will join us. Congressman Walden is the ranking Republican on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, if you were listening today, you'll receive an invitation to that webinar as well, and we hope you'll be able to join us again. Thank you and have a great day.